Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one, we pay homage to him. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So we pay homage in that way in respect to our teacher, who is our primary teacher. And we look at our primary guide as being Bhante, uh, Bhante Vimala Ramsey from Dhammasukha meditation. And we have lots of teachers who are growing up in this, and it's very, very exciting what's happening now. Um, let's say, going to be reading to you part of the Anupada Sutta, not the whole entire Sutta, but a part of it. I'm on page 119 of uh, Delson Armstrong's book called uh, A Mind Without Craving. If you've seen us, if you haven't had a chance to, to see it yet, uh, the, that doesn't like it, does it? I'm not sure why. <laughs> That's okay, but it's called A Mind Without Craving, and it's by Delson Armstrong. And this section that I'm going to go into is really about hindrances, and we've talked about hindrances before, but I want you to hear how he's writing about it, because some of the things he's written are extremely good, and I wish uh, I had the time to jot some of these down. I'm going to be doing some of the um, pages that are going to run from uh, 119 to 131, and then I want to hear a discussion from you all about your hindrances and how you have handled it and uh, how you've been successful or had some trouble with certain hindrances coming back, what that means maybe, uh, and different types. Uh, you can ask questions about different types of solutions would be really good. So this is Majima Nikaya number 111, the Anupada Sutta one by one as they occurred. And the translation is by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the blessed one was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anapapindaka's Park. And there he addressed the bhikkhus thus and said, bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. And the blessed one said this, bhikkhus, Sariputta is wise. Sariputta has great wisdom. Sariputta has wide wisdom. Sariputta has joyous wisdom. Sariputta has quick wisdom. Sariputta has keen wisdom. Sariputta has penetrative wisdom. Half a month, bhikkhus, Sariputta had insight into states one by one as they occurred. Now, Sariputta's insight into states one by one as they occurred was this, and we go into a description of these states. Let's talk about this first paragraph for just a minute. Uh, for those who haven't heard it before, the way we look at this in twin practice, when we, when we look at it, we say that the word wisdom refers to dependent origination, a clear understanding, a seeing and understanding of the links of dependent origination, especially the seven links that we use from day to day that help us to see how precisely everything is working with suffering and the cessation of suffering. So here he's saying wide wisdom, joyous wisdom, he has great joy in being able to see this clearly and how it works. Quick wisdom, he can spot it when he's in his daily life, he can spot it in his practice. Very keen wisdom, keen is very sharply, clearly seeing something. Penetrative wisdom would be seeing it in the deeper states of meditation, how it's working in the slightest tension arising and craving and coming up, how that is all working. And these adjectives, you can see how if you substitute that word of dependent origination for wisdom, when you're looking in this particular sutta, 
really fits how we're practicing with TWIM. Now here, Bhikkhus, he continues, quite secluded from sensual pleasures and secluded from unwholesome states, Sariputta entered and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. These are the substitute words we use for applied and sustained thought and rapture and pleasure. The reason we do that it's kind of interesting. Applied and sustained thought drew kind of this response from a whole group of people. Huh? Hmm. <laughs> Nobody got it when we used to read it. And as soon as Bonte was able to come up with a good substitute for this, he said, applied is vitaka and sustained is vichara. So we're talking about the thinking as it first happens and this is the um, thinking and um, thinking and examining, examining. Can someone turn off their mic? I don't know who has. I'm sorry, it's mine. OK, OK. Um, <clears throat> and then the less was rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. The reason that we did that was because of the heavy emphasis on the last days in Christianity and the rapture is confused. When we say this to a lot of people where there are Christians, they think we're talking about the rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. That's okay, but we, we say this pleasure is, the term pleasure is used so often outside of the meditation that when you're talking about inside the meditation, it's a state of sukha, a contented feeling of sutta. Of, of, of the sukha, the Buddhist happiness. And that's an inner kind of contentment. And, um, you know, actually I talked to Delson about these words, you know, but he was using exactly Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. That's great the way he's done this. I'm just pointing it out to you that when we write it, a lot of times we point that out so that you can get the exact thing that's going on in the first jhana. And the states in the first jhana, this is important to listen to because it tells you something specific about Sariputta. It's going to tell you the state of mind that he was in when he was doing this practice. And the states in the first jhana, the applied thought and sustained thought or thinking and examining, the joy and happiness, the unification of mind. And this can be the collectedness of mind the productive unification or collectedness of mind, whichever you want to say. But if you just say unification by itself, it sounds too tight. And that's what we saw the students doing. So we loosened it just a little tiny bit, like tuning a string and found out we say uh, unification unification now we're, we're specifying what we're looking for in the level of the concentration and then he says the contact feeling perception volition and mind uh, they're still there they're still active and when you look at these contact feeling perception volition and mind is the same thing as the aggregates body feeling perception thoughts and consciousness so the aggregates are not blocked off in this practice very clearly they are still active and open and then the enthusiasm zeal was like a little too much for us <laughs> i don't know about uh, non-english speakers but for english speakers zeal is like um evangelical <laughs> you know and it was like we didn't want to say something that strong, but the, um, the zeal is enthusiasm is a word you find in the, uh, in the um, thesaurus all the time for zeal. So we, enthusiasm is a good one. Enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. And if we look at these, this is how he sets himself up for success in his practice. He sets himself up with enthusiasm to follow the instructions. He understands he has the power of decision during the observation. In other words, he is powerful enough to make a decision to stop the movement away from the 
object of meditation to the hindrance or keep it with the object, you see? That's what's talking about decision and the decision to run your six hours or not. These are decisions you're making. Energy, mindfulness is your observation power, equanimity is your balance and attention. Attention is an interest factor. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Now we see known to him the states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. Now this is cool because this is how everything works. And he's telling you precisely if you carry what he found inside his meditation into life, absolutely every state that we were to suffer from sadness or depression or uh, irritability or uh, frustration about something, they weren't there. And then they arose and then they were present and then they disappeared. And so understanding this coming to watch this clearly and see it is a big part of your discovery factor in the twin practice. He understood thus. So indeed these states not having been, they come into being and having been, they vanish. There you are. He's witnessing Anicca every single time he goes through one of these levels very clearly. Regarding those states, now this is how he set up his mind. He abided, meaning he carried out his meditation distinctly de with the determination not to be attracted towards anything, not to repel anything or push it away, to remain independent, detached, and free, and dissociated from any uh, judgmental opinion about anything that he was seeing. That's what I want you to understand. So unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers. Now, this phrase, with a mind rid of barriers, is important because you're not in a jhana unless you're free from the barriers, which these barriers are your hindrances arising. So very much so this, this kind of a practice is an in and out practice like this. It's in and out. But when you understand how everything operates in this practice, you learn very specifically and clearly how everything works. How does the suffering start to happen? What is the cause of it? How can I experience the cessation of it? And how does this work in relationship to your, your practice steps? It's, it's very clear. He understood there is an escape beyond this level. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. And again, because the stilling of thinking and examining thought, Sariputta uh, entered and abided in the second jhana. And so the stilling of the thinking and examining the thoughts all begin to slow down. And then with, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind with thinking and without the thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of this level of concentration, this level of collectedness of mind. And the states in the second jhana, there was self-confidence, which increases because you begin to understand how everything works. The joy, the happiness, and the unification of mind, balanced unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, these are all the same. The enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, these states are defined by him one by one as they occur. Again, he's able to watch these, making a point in the second jhana, he is able to be watching these clearly. Known to him, the states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared, and he understood with the cultivation of that attainment that he confirmed that there is more to, to come. And again, uh, with the fading away as well of joy, 
Sariputta abided and in the equanimity and he was mindful and fully aware. He keeps pointing out he's fully aware, still feeling joy with the body. He enters upon and abides in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones will announce he has a pleasant abiding, who has equanimity and is mindful. Equanimity is a big addition here. Equanimity is in the first, it's in the second, but when it reaches the third, it's really an obvious addition that's important because it's a balancing factor. You become very still. You don't want to come out. You're very pleasant and you're very well uh, in a position to keep going longer. So he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. Mindful meaning continues to observe. When you look at it that way, it fits perfectly in here. And then the states in the third jhana, the equanimity, the happy joy and mindfulness, <clears throat> I'm sorry, happiness and mindfulness and full awareness once again, restating the full awareness is there and that the balanced unification of mind is present. And then you have the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind, the uh, enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, these are all still active and states defined by him one by one as they're occurring, known to him the states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood that with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed there was more to see and saw that there is, okay. Now, in this one, what's happening in the equanimity part, you have this full awareness and you're able to watch very clearly as you're going through the third level, but you're very, you're much more still and calm because you have a stronger equanimity base. And by now you're beginning to lose your, a little bit of your feeling in your body. And you can begin to do this between this one and the fourth one, you are beginning to lose the feeling in your body a little bit. So again, monks, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of the joy or grief, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. There's a ceasing of the pulling towards a something of pleasure or something of pain in either direction. There's much less of this because of the equanimity and balanced and it's due to the equanimity. And the states in the fourth jhana, the equanimity, the neither painful nor pleasant feeling, the mental unconcern due to tranquility, the purity of mindfulness, balanced unification of mind, contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind are still there, full awareness. If I touch you in any of these levels, if I tap you on the shoulder, you have a call from home, you should be able to come out, take the call, go back, sit, go back into the meditation. That's possible. And the, the, the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. And known to him the states arose and known they were present, known they disappeared. He watched them as if they occurred. And with the cultivation of these things, he confirmed there still is more. He knows there's still more. So now he's going to go into surmounting perceptions of form with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact. And we say usually perceptions of gross uh, sensory impact here um, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite. He's beginning to feel infinite space. The fullness of your head, the feeling is very likely if you're just starting, your feeling is moving, moving up across the chest area, up into the head, up into here. And 
I just moved myself and locked where I was. <laughs> Okay, and he began to feel when this is happening, the base of infinite space, we're beginning to feel a fullness in the head. It's like we usually to ask you the question without saying, are you in base of infinite space? We can't say that out to you, but we'll say something like, do you feel a fullness in your head? Or do you feel it's like, like a balloon that's full, a full balloon that's pressing with helium and it's sort of pressing or when you close your eyes, do things kind of move away from you? These are the indicators. Any of those are indicators enough uh, for me to say, okay, Ed, it's time for you to maybe uh, start working on the other kinds of people. That's a, a point where you want to pick up on this, that it's time for that to happen. The um, indicator of base of infinite space is a, is a good sign for that part too. And the states of the base of infinite space, the perception of the base of infinite space, the productive unification of mind, the contact feeling perception, volition and mind still active, the enthusiasm, decision, energy level, productive mindfulness, equanimity and attention. These things are balancing. These things are balancing out for you. And these states are defined by him one by one as they are occurring. And known to him, those states arose, known they were present, known they disappear. And he understood that with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is still more to do. So now it gets very interesting. I particularly like base of infinite, uh, infinite space. I like the feeling of the openness. There's a, there's a vast feeling inside internally in the body and the head that can develop if you sit in this for a couple of hours, you know, and as you're sitting, uh, you're just watching. At first, when you first experience it moving away, it's a little bit disconcerting because you can't tell if you are in the center of this like a peg and everything is moving out like that from you or if there is no center, but there isn't a center. And you keep watching and you realize there isn't a center. The point is that you're moving into the mental states here. And so in the mental states, you're not there anymore. You've lost feeling in the body most of the body can be gone or even part of the body and it'll continue to disappear up to here usually, but for some people it'll go all the way to the top. And later on when you're practicing longer periods, it just, you just disappear because you don't, you don't have any concern for a me. In the equation of watching the practice, you're looking at what is this whole process? What am I watching? I'm curious about that. And you're not thinking about it as a me and I am watching as much as just a pure kind of observation of con consciousness. Now we come to again monks by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, becoming aware that con consciousness is infinite. And Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite consciousness. And the states in the base of infinite consciousness, the perception of the base of infinite consciousness and the uh, unification of mind, the contact feeling, perception, volition in mind, the zeal or enthusiasm, decision, energy, and mindfulness, your observation power, your equanimity, your balance, and your attention. These states are defined by him one by one as they occur. And known to him, these states arose, known they were present, known they disappear. He understood thus that with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. There is more to do. And again, monks, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, Sariputta entered upon an abide in the base of nothingness. Nothingness is sort of, for some people, irritation land. 
<laughs> we have an active type A character coming to meditate and there's always busy, busy, busy stuff to do. And there's always stuff running through their mind. And it's been like this in their job for a number of years. And for them, it's difficult. It is hard sometimes to deal with the idea that now you're gonna be asked to watch nothing. And the states, because uh, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, he, I'm sorry, he comes into this nothingness. And Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of nothingness. And, and the states in the base of nothingness were similar with the perception of the base of nothingness and the unification of mind. There's the contact, feeling, perception, volition, and mind. The enthusiasm, the decision is still capable of decision here energy mindfulness you you manage your energy and you manage your observation and the equanimity and balance and attention you manage those and these states were defined by him one by one the states are known one with the cultivation of that attainment he confirmed that there is a little more to do if you go back to infinite consciousness what i didn't say about it is the infinite consciousness level what is in what is interesting for that level is there will start like a sometimes a tapping like on this bone in the cheek right here or there'll be a tone it's a very high pitch inside the head that is is a, ha a tone that is happening or there can come the lights that come across the screen from you know from the screen in front of you that you're watching and the lights are just going like bloop, 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 bloop. it's like the flickering of an eight millimeter projector if you can have ever seen that where it starts to flick on the film like this the light and then it will slow down if you just calmly back off and just sort of watch it'll slow down from going like this to going like that and then it'll just be like that and then it'll get slower now why how can it do that <laughs> you know how can it get slower and what is actually causing this to appear for it to get slower and i had this discussion with a neurologist he said well it's not quite like that and i said you know what I'm gonna tell you is not quite like this. I understand that because the brain is not going to slow down when you meditate, but it appears like everything is slowing down. How can that be? Because if your observation is speeding up and you're surrendering to just watching, it gets sharper and sharper, the awareness and the observation gets sharper and so if it catches up with the speed of this, and then your observation is about the same way like that, watching it, you see, then all of a sudden it looks like it's slower. He surrendered to me and said it's a good way of explaining it, but it would be a lot more science involved in it than we want to talk about in going to explain integrally what is really happening with the brain and what is happening with what's going on inside with your observation in the brain. But it's reasonable to explain it to a student that way if you're teaching, because that's exactly what it appears like. And you can begin to watch things going very, very slowly. And you see them quite clearly, which makes you realize Sariputta really did practice this way. He really was able to see this. So again, monks, the completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, as I said, we went into nothingness. And nothingness, as I said, it can get very frustrating for me to ask you to watch nothing after you've been watching something. And it feels like you're going back to being 15 years old and saying, OK, where did it all begin? <laughs> and you're saying something came from nothing at some point in time. You want to go there with the creation of everything. <laughs> but is it quite like that? You have to 
challenge the student, and I'm talking from an angle of help, trying to help teachers. If you're trying to teach anyone, what do I tell this person who had so much running through their mind? What am I supposed to tell them? The most successful thing I've had with this to explain to uh, someone and then have them go back and it works fine is to ask, ask them to let me personally hire them as an explorer. I'm gonna hire you as an explorer and it's like you're going to go to the North Pole for the very first time and no one's been there like Admiral Byrd and you have to tell everybody what is the North Pole? Well, here you are sitting in front of a big screen and I told you to go see the movie. <laughs> and then you got in there and there's nothing there. Nothing, nothing is there at all. So the question is, what do I do with nothing? You just keep watching. And this is very frustrating, as I said, for the person who has been in charge, in control, and taking care of everything like an office manager person, you know, is like, what do you mean just watch? <laughs> there must be something I need to collect, organize, file, and remember, or something. Mm -mm, there's nothing. And it's a, it's a level to get you to a place where you can actually experience the next level. So let's hear, go here. Completely surmounting the base of nothingness, Sariputta enters upon abides in the base of neither perception or non-perception. He emerged mindful from the attainment. And having done so, he contemplated the past states. Why is this one different? Ah, because he's neither perceiving what's going on or not perceiving it. What does it mean? The defining of this in the Vasudhimaga and also in other writings about this over the years has basically been pretty accurate in saying, you don't know you're there when you're there. And when you come out of your meditation, you come out of your session, the reaction basically is going to be, what just happened? That's what you want, you're asking. What exactly just happened? Was I sleeping or was I actually meditating? And the suggestion is, the instruction is that um, you stay seated for about four minutes or so, three or four minutes, and you just tell your mind to recall and see what comes up. And anything that pops up into your mind uh, it can be a color, it can be a pattern, it can be a brief movement or wiggle. It, it can be a, um, let's see, pattern, color, shape, some distinct shape or something that happened, but it doesn't matter what it is. You have to, at this point, you your curiosity investigation, those two, two buttons are shut off. You're just witnessing. And so you want to recall a witnessing and so there was pink, six R it. There was a square with a line or pet six R it. There was blue that was the shit six R it. So it's this system is six R ing, is doing right effort, right striving immediately on it and just letting it go. When it stops popping up, and it's not usually a long time that it keeps doing this, uh, then when you take a walk, if you get up slowly, and you start your walking, it might still pop into your mind while you're walking, six R and immediately, six R and immediately. So what is this message, the six R uh, really saying about hindrances is if we were to step back a moment, if you did any other practice and just pretend you don't know anything about hindrances at all and go to what the Buddha is instructing us only to what he said to his monks about Henderson. We can't come up with an enemy. We can't come up with anything to fight with. Uh, we, we begin to understand how the hindrance is actually working because he tells us what the nutriment for the hindrance is, which is my personal attention, makes the hindrance bigger, stronger, and and stays longer. And that's called careless attention in the Samyutta Nikaya. It's called careless attention on anything that arises will prevent 
the enlightenment factors from coming up. At this point in the game, I would say roughly from the uh, level of nothingness and then neither perception or non-perception, at that particular level especially, okay, before it all, it all stands as well. But you really want to remember what we teach you in the beginning of your training about specifics on hindrances. What is the hindrance? How does it work? What is its nutriment? And how can we have the cessation of hindrances occur without any struggle, without anything powerful or pushing or trying to suppress, subdue, what are the usually, I usually say destroy, annihilate, eradicate, suffocate, suppress, subdue, stop the hindrances. None of this is in the texts. And we tried to find it. I tried to find it once. I got so frustrated. I said, look, 80% of the people or more that I talk to are struggling with hindrances really hard. In many different practices, there must be something here in the text that told them to do that. And I went on a journey search and sort of, it's, we call it, used to call it, um, um, in a Bible, we would call it scripture chase. I wanted to find the scripture, the text that said, this is an enemy. I have to kill it. I have to stop it. I have to subdue it and bury it and make it so it can't bother me. There's a big problem with that, though. And I knew that in the beginning when I started the search and Monty sort of smiled at me and let me do it. <laughs> you know, he smiled at me and he knew perfectly well what was going to happen, but he let me do it anyway. And I searched and I searched and I searched and there wasn't anything there. There's only one sutta that might not even be long in the, in the Majjhima Nikaya that you would question. And the reason I'm saying that sutta might be one to really question is because there is one sutta out of 152 that treat things really, really roughly. And there's no other one in the 152 that supports it at all. But if we look at the fact uh, that you should be allowing it and letting it arise and just leaving it alone and letting it be and believe in the facts of the knowledge the Buddha is telling you about the hindrance, then it's just going to fade away. So the number one thing it's going to tell you about the hindrance is there's nothing in anything that arises that has anything to do with improving your meditation or reaching Nibbana. If you were to take it and start to try to stop the hindrance. There's no reason to be doing that. Number number two, you do want to eliminate it. And what I discovered is if you follow the Buddha's precise instructions for how to manage the hindrance, guess what happens? It becomes destroyed and annihilated and eradicated. <laughs> and I'm there like, look at this, it becomes destroyed and eradicated and it's, it's going to be gone. Well, how did that happen? because I took its food away, because I denied it personal attention. And why is giving it personal attention so wrong? Well, because of anicca dukkha anatta, you see? Because, because the hindrance, first of all, is always going to not be there. Listen to the phrase, you heard it a number of times in here, uh, in each one of these sections, you heard me say, um, known to him, defined by him, one by one they occurred, known to him the states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. They always disappear. They always disappear. But you're denying the law of Anicca if you pay attention to the hindrance. That's number one. Number two, he tells you in various places that whatever arises, whatever um, object arises will not become an obstruction unless you personally engage it. What does it mean to engage? I love the student that asked me that. <laughs> Immediately raised hand. What does it mean to engage? Well, I would say if I tell you to stay here, and this is where the object of meditation is, and you go over there to May, 
<laughs> next to me. Okay. And she's, she's the, let's say that she's the hindrance. Okay. If you move over there and say, who are you? That, that is engaging the hindrance. If you even move away from where I am to go over there and you're halfway over, that's engaging the hindrance. If you even feel the tension arising right here, thinking the picture of May in your head, okay, and it's starting to get tense because it's not part of your object of meditation, it's time to do the six R's. Now, this is a remarkable point in training for those of you who have ever done Vipassana. Wake up, hello, because if you've done Vipassana, you were studying, you were practicing the awareness in your body, anywhere in your body of tension arising. That's what you were doing, isn't it? And so when they explained to me what they were doing, I say, aha, that's why on a chart of 20 students, five of them are going click, 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 click like that with their six R's. They're moving right along. And why are they moving right along? Because I told them a secret they didn't have, they didn't hear it before. Craving always manifests as tension and tightness in the mind and in the body. It's the I don't like it or the I like it mind. That's what it is. So when the moment craving starts to form, just starts to form with the thought of May, <laughs> no offense, <laughs> with the thought of the, of the, uh, the uh, hindrance, the moment it starts to feel this, and the, low, the more you're practicing the six R's, you are reducing the tension in your body. So if you are practicing your six R's correctly, every time you do the relax step, you go loop there. And now we're practicing and we think of men, we go over, we let go, we come back and we next time we relax and smile and come back you're lowering the tension systematically in your body this is a remarkable practice you're doing right striving the right way you see that and so the lower the tension becomes the earlier you can detect the arising of tension or concern about a hindrance and that earlier you can do the six R's. So this whole process of the six R's is completing four steps in right effort. The first one is to recognize the unwholesome mind state, which is the tension and tightness and concern over something away from your object of meditation. Mm -hmm. So that first one is to recognize, second one is to release it release it and we bring in the tranquilizing step in the training of the Anapanasati, which has the full set of instructions for meditation tells us tranquilize on the in-breath, tranquilize on the out-breath. So you relax the mind. Why the mind? Why not tell us to stop and do a scan and do our whole body from our head to our toes? Well, because the Buddha went one step beyond. He's the Buddha. And he went one step beyond. And he said, what we're going to look at here is where is the control center for the whole shebang, how the whole thing works, the whole body. It's up here. So if you relax this, what do we know about Nama Rupa? Do you see how all these are woven in together? They're all woven like this together. So when you say, oh, Nama Rupa, oh, yeah. Uh, mental and physical, the combination of the mental involvement or the Nama Rupa relationship of mental and physical body. We take it to that place. And if I relax my mind, what happens to my blood pressure? What happens to my heartbeat? What happens to my stomach system, my gastrointestinal system? What happens? It all relaxes. There you go. So I'm not surprised when I figured out, well, the Buddha just went one, one upmanship on this whole thing. And he went one step further and he said, there must have been a key. And he figured out the key. And when he relaxes the mind, it relaxes the body. So you don't have to stop and do a scan. I have people who were insisting on stopping and doing a scan and they weren't increasing their time for their meditation. I'm there, why aren't you increasing it? Well, what are you doing when you relax? Well, I have to relax. They were giving me numbers. 
I wish I had my pen, but I can't use the pen with this, uh, <coughs> this computer. I haven't figured that out yet. Um, and the, the numbers I take when you come to me for interviews, what I'm asking you for is how long was your longest sitting? So somebody says two hours, okay? That's 120 minutes, okay? And then how many minutes were you able, let's do it with 60 minutes, and then how many minutes were you able to stay on your object of meditation before you were pulled away? Oh, uh, oh dear, only maybe two minutes. Now, do some math with me right now. That means the person roughly, probably, he did, he came, he went, came, went, came, went about 30, 32 times in a 60 minute period. He couldn't sit with the object of meditation almost at all. So there's a few things you have to examine right away. Well, what is your object of meditation? Do you even like the person? If you're talking about teaching someone the beginning of this teaching, do you even like this person <laughs> You know that you would just leave them in two minutes? Why? You were told to keep the person with you all the time. They're supposed to be walking with you, sitting with you, eating with you, sleeping with you during the retreat in your mind. This, this, is, like, this is like your deceased mother giving you permission finally, after all these years, to have a secret friend. Whoopee! <laughs> I can have a secret, a, you know, a secret friend. And my secret friend is going to stay with me all the time. That's how important that spiritual friend was. And we, if we don't keep emphasizing that and emphasizing it, if we, if we assume the student understands this loss game, I didn't understand it. He needed to tell me at least 40 times, <laughs> you know, but most, most retreats you watch, there are students that will just do what you ask them to do. Fantastic. But that's not the majority. That is not the majority. The teacher needs to repeat the same thing again and again. And then the thing that happens to the teacher that Bonte pointed out to me when I was starting to teach, he says, you're going to want to tell them a different way, tell them a better way, tell them your way okay, it doesn't help. And he, he tried to do this when he started teaching originally. He said, I found out that the really good and outstanding teacher in, in uh, TWIM, this is what he told me, is the one that is willing to say the same exact thing to you 100 or more times until you come to the door and you knock and you open the door and they say to you, you know what I just figured out? <laughs> And they say back to you what you said to them. And then don't, don't tell them that you, I told you that 550 times. What you do is you, you say to them, that's wonderful. That's great. Go back and sit some more. And then you turn around and you walk away shaking your head. You know, I was not believing that they could say that to you after listening to you say it to them about 150 times. And that that were the first six of us on the mountain. That's what was happening first. That's how thick we were. So don't feel bad wherever you are. Okay. That's how it began. And so this idea of the of the hindrance is understanding the law of the hindrance. Number one, it doesn't have any information for you. Number two, how it operates is very, very important for you to understand that it operates on the food that you give it. And what you give it is your personal attention, okay? And that's what you need to stop. Stop doing the personal attention and come back and just let it alone. Why? If you keep saying why, you should be saying by now, Anicha. <laughs> you should be making a little flag like this, an orange flag with little, you know, black letters on it. Says, Anicha, the Anicha team. You see a little, little, um, what do you call it? Team flag. And remember that Anicha is your friend in this respect. Anicha may make you irritable if you have to move more irritable if they evict you, <laughs> you know, um, feeling bad about things. But the thing about it is this too shall pass away, I guess is the Christian version of that one. This too shall pass away. There it is. That's Shakespeare. 
We don't know what he was, Buddhist or Christian. We have no idea, but he was a pretty good guy. He had some pretty good phrases for people to remember. And he was talking and referring to, when he was doing that, he was referring to uh, the, Anichas, the Anichas system. So that's what you need to remember about the hindrance, basically. Now, the rest of the sutta, he's just going, he emerged uh, from the attainment and having done so, he contemplated the past states which had ceased and changed. So indeed these states have not having been, they come into being and having been, they vanish. There's your Anicca again. And regarding the states, he abided always, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated with a mind rid of barriers. It sounds like a rap song. <laughs> now we should learn it by heart. You know, he, let's see. Regarding those states he abided, he was unattracted and unrepelled. He was independent, detached, and free, was disassociated with a mind, rid of barriers, no more hindrances, because he understood exactly how to handle them. And what was that? I, I had that new word. Oh, yeah. Zaudia. <laughs> Zaudia. Never mind them. Let them go. Let them be. They'll change. And the bhikkhus, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception or non-perception, he entered upon, abided into the cessation of perception and feeling. And we say perception, feeling, and consciousness. We can't figure this out. Perception, feeling, and consciousness, if you draw the little circles and make the little you know, uh, molecule like in chemistry, you have perception, feeling, and consciousness are conjoined. They cannot exist alone. If they disappear, they all disappear. We know this now. You know, perception, feeling, and consciousness turns off, then consciousness turns back on. It's described in 44, and then feeling, and then perception. See, it, it comes back on again. So, and his taints were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. Oh, what the heck did that mean? <laughs> he saw dependent origination in this whole thing. His taints were destroyed by his seeing clearly how the suffering, what, what it was, the cause of it, the cessation of it, and how the escape operates. So what's the one about the escape I'm, you're always giving you is 148, which appears in other places, other suttas as well. He's carefully, he has carefully observed the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, how you get involved or not get involved, right? The danger of that and the escape. The origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape. That's what you have to learn in order to experience Nibbana. Once you understand this completely, if you just sit quietly, long enough, it all just completely stops. And it turns off, everything turns off. Then what happens when it turns back on is the uh, coming back on of the dependent, the human cognition is what dependent origination is. It shuts off and then it comes back on. And as it comes back on, bang, that's where the opening occurs, okay? So um, your Nibbana. So he emerged mindful from the attainment and having done so, he recalled his past states, which had ceased and changed. And so indeed these states not having been, they came into being and having been, they vanish. Regarding the states, he abided still unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated with a mind rid of barriers. He must have been a rap singer. <laughs> Teasing. All right. Um, he understood this is there is no escape beyond. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is not any more to go. Rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, Sariputta has attained mastery and perfection in noble virtue, attained mastery and perfection in the noble concentration, is perfected 
a balanced concentration that was a productive level of concentration, which allowed him to see these things. He attained mastery and perfection in noble wisdom. He saw the dependent origination and he's able to watch it in all types of levels of experience. He attained mastery and perfection of noble deliverance because he had reached the end and he went through and experienced the opening. And it is, if of Sariputta indeed, rightly speaking, we should be said that uh, were, it, were it to be said of anyone, he is the son of the blessed one. He's born of his breast, born of his mouth, born of the Dhamma, created by the Dhamma. He is an heir in the Dhamma not an heir in material things. It is of Sariputta indeed, rightly speaking, that this should be said. And the bhikkhus, the matchless wheel of Dhamma said rolling by the Tathagata is kept rolling rightly by Sariputta. It's like a stamp of approval. This is a good way to teach it, guys. This is a good way to go out there and teach them because you can experience this, you can utilize it in life, you can use, be keeping it with you all the time. And he's basically describing the twin, the twin, uh, the description given to us in twin. So it's 3.30. <laughs> I wanted it to be an hour. So this, this is, I'm not sure if I can get through this other part here, but I can, I pointed out some things in it. You go to one page 124, at the bottom of the first uh, paragraph, this part is the Dhamma talk that Delson was giving, suppressing about suppressing the, and the hindrances and how we, they got to this point. But suppressing the hindrances is like a metaphor. I love this. It's like a metaphor of a beach ball, which you push underwater and upon releasing it, it jumps back up and splashes out in, the same way as the hindrances do by using um, one point of concentration or something where you try to make this stop. Anything that's disturbing that you try to make it stop, you can push and get like this and get all upset and, argh, 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 and it's not gonna help you at all because when you're finished, it's just gonna come back again tomorrow and again and again and again, that's what's gonna happen to it, okay? so. What he's trying to point out, if you took a beach ball in a pool and you just push it down, you'd have to try and sit on it if you wanted to. This is equivalent to trying to destroy it, er, destroy it, annihilate it, eradicate it, suffocate it, suppress it, subdue it, make it stop. So your whole, your whole session is about holding this beach ball under the water, but it's going to pop out. And where we were explaining it to you, when you go back into life, what happens is whatever you were working on in your session during your retreat, the hardest is going to pop back right up in the street and gonna come back in, in main life because you didn't know certain things. You didn't have a set of knowledge is the only reason this happened. So if you go down the bottom of the page, when you generate a wholesome quality of mind through one of the Brahma Viharas, you also allow a space for the mind to observe that Brahma Vihara. And when you give um, mind that space, you allow for it to flow. This is, this is the difference between um, in meditation where we're actually trying to be involved and control and be the best one at it and manage it and get there first and the rest of it, okay? Versus one that is, there's enough information for you giving mind the space. Every time that you do the six R's, every time you recognize something that's tight and you let go and you relax, smile and come back. Between the relax and the smile, there's a tiny little spot called pure mind. And pure mind, once you see that, can be very exciting for you because I know it's maybe not supposed to be so exciting, but <laughs> it's very exciting to all of a sudden realize cessation state is a real state because what is happening between the relaxed step and the smile, you know, relax, smile, come back. So it's the relaxed step and the smile between those two, 
is so tiny, but you can feel if you watch carefully, no craving at all. You are not there. It's not happening. It's not there. So you are allowing the mind to free flow. You will see the different factors of the jhana, be, begin to be able to notice them and the different elements within each jhana, just as Sariputta rightly pointed out. You'll begin to notice the rupa jhanas, the form jhanas, which are their first four jhanas. And you'll, there is still perception of form in that jhana. When you practice, you take a look. In other words, there is still contact of a form with the outside world. You can still have someone touch you and open your eyes and say, what is it? Okay, fine, I'll do it later and close your eyes and keep going. If you suppress the mind in any way, you also suppress the sensory experiences. And if even for a second, your mindfulness slips, your observation falls down, or you stop paying attention and something distracts you from the outside, it's going to cause an irritation and it's going to cause a further distraction. But if your mind, you keep your mind spacious and open, just like letting go of everything and any sensory experience that arises, you just let go of it, understanding how Anicca works. You understand it was there and then it goes away and you let go of any attachment to it through your attention and, and your using of the six R's and the four effective applications to come back to your object of meditation, as you keep doing this through the, uni the, the correct level of concentration, then he's calling it a mindful uh, mindset. I'm calling it a productive unification. That's where you're coming back to. Mindset is okay. You want to grab that one and use it. It sounds pretty good. You're, you're, um, you're basically reaching a unified mindset so that you can watch without any pressure what's in front of you and just notice what's happening as you keep going and there's no pressure. And through this unification of mind, um, the attention that is rooted, you're, it's rooted in reality. So what is reality? This means that you are paying attention to the reality as it is unfolding. You're not trying to create anything or deviate or any dream, imagine anything. There, you're watching the reality as it unfolds, even while you're in the jhana. This is pure, pure, pure observation. And when you pay attention to the mind observing this way, using right mindfulness, you observe, you're observing um, your vehicle of meditation. You begin to understand this meditation that you're practicing was the vehicle that the Buddha was using in order to see how precisely everything works, okay? And then, but you, you, don't, uh, you don't allow the mind to grasp on to the object at all, to focus to such an extent that it does not let go of the object of meditation. You don't do that. So you would not, for instance, concentrate on the spiritual friend and fall in love with them so much that you wouldn't be able to think straight. That's, that's one reason we can't, another reason why we can't use uh, the opposite sex when we're using that. But when this happens, it would invariably create a craving by holding on to the object in any way. So you have to be careful who the object is you're using. And it would create a restlessness because the mind is just trying too much. Now, all of this trying too much, doing too much uh, and stuff. Remember, we have another issue other than the subject of hindrances. And the other thing that we talk about often here is atta and anatta and learning atta and anatta. Now I'm gonna stop, I'm here, I'm gonna stop. So anytime you, you feel that this atta is active, I want to control, I want to do this, I want to push it here, anything like that, that's 
off sites, off the reservation, because you know that on the reservation, there's a set of things. If you remember, treats you a capsule of things you need to do to learn the material of Dhamma. If you knew those things on one page, it was, you would be able to know about sort of what's on the reservation and what's off sides. One thing that's really off sides and will stop your progress immediately is getting involved personally in anything or anything you can bring back to, I am doing this, I want, I must have, I try, I this or anything. The moment you realize you're doing that, you realize you're going off sides, stop a minute, come back, look at it and say, no, 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 she said, just watch to see what happens next when you sit in meditation. I'm gonna stop here. Next time we can keep going from the same spot. I thought you need to tell me if you're interested in this or not. If you are interested, we'll, we'll keep going because some of this is really good the way that he's writing it. So throw up some questions now for about 10 minutes and we'll call it, okay? Hmm? Okay, I see you. <laughs> Um, a quick one, Sister Kema. Uh, most of the time when we meditate, or sometime when we meditate, like you uh, said earlier, you're on the object of meditation for say five minutes or maybe 10 minutes, um, then um, our attention diverts, or uh, you know, you're moving away from the moving away from the object, but you are still aware that you are you are doing that. You are aware that yes, I have moved away from the object, but willfully you allow it for one minute or two minutes and then come back. Okay, let me make a suggestion here to you. Did you did you see a minute ago where I said there's actually there's three different levels here where where I can I can used to draw the little seat like this and I'd say you're sitting here. I would go like this and I would say you're sitting here and here's where your object is. And I told you guys, you know. You're, you're working with this object in front of you, but over here, like in your mind is still producing all these thoughts and things. And if some thought over here is strange and your curiosity pushes you a little bit over, what's happening is there's three different degrees that can occur. First is you notice something is sliding into your attention zone. That's real close in. Uh, let's do it. The furthest one away is you're already over here. You got pulled away and you're not with your object anymore. That'd be the first one in the beginner. Okay. And then you say, oh, I'm off. Now I have to do the six R's. Another one, the second level is right here in the middle. Like here's my head and here's the object over here. Okay. Okay. Um, halfway you you realize you're moving away from your spiritual friend you're moving away do the six hours then right then okay or the best one is i come back to the vipassana student who can sense that something is just starting to change in the meditation and as something's coming up that's going to change what they're interested in they feel the tension rise and they do the six hours and so they're the ones that will reach the six R's are happening automatically the fastest. But all of us had to work. I would, I used to be the one that was always, always all the way out here, all the way over here by this, by this object, you see, by, by this object here, okay? But the middle one, the middle path, this is gonna be funny. <laughs> okay, we got all these funny little bottles again. So here's the object over here. Whoops, you like that? Okay, here's the one in the middle and where my mouth is right here. That's the one closest in my mind. It's just in my mind and my mind's tension is gonna move. There are two things I'm gonna tell you about this, okay? Where, whichever degree you're at in your practice, just six R. Six R, six R, six R. That's the thing. But don't just six R, six R and smile, six R and smile, six R and smile. This is what I want my teachers really to be saying to their student every single time without fail you were not there when i wrote those i i did the transcription for the instructions for <laughs> that bhakti says when he teaches the uh the meta meditation and i know that uh major he translated it and i can't read it so i don't know if in his copy it must say smile 17 times 
in that 12 minute presentation, it must say and smile and smile and smile and smile until you're green in the face. I had to do that transcription at least five or seven times before he would accept it. And he, I said, what's wrong with it? He said, listen carefully to it again. And I said, and smile and smile and smile and smile. So see, what's so easy is when I first started teaching, he criticized me a lot. And he, let's say he admonished me a lot. <laughs> And uh, he would admonish me, how? Because I'm not telling the person the solution 90% of the time. And what is the solution? Smile. Because the secret is not just one thing, which everybody thinks is the big deal, the relaxed step. It was the relaxed step and the smile. Because what was the smile about? It was about the muscle triggering the opening of the mind the access to the dopamine and the other stuff, you know, uh, endorphins and, and, and dopamine in, in the head. That's what it was about, is the lightening of the head that sharpens the, the awareness. And the sharper the awareness happens, then the closer you, you come in here, closer to the um, object of meditation, you stay with it. Uh, and you, the moment you feel yourself even just wobble, you six R, you six R, you six R. Later we say relax. When we're in quiet mind, we tell you and relax. And the relax signals the six R's. It's just like a like that. It's happening inside your brain because it it registered in where in the control room. <laughs> you see in the control room. Okay, so what's the question? Do you have a question further on it? Uh, uh, what I'm saying is um, the awareness is still there, but it's like a dimmer switch, you know, it just gone down and then it come back quickly. It is, I'm not fully off the track with the object of meditation at the same time is slowly, you know. So you're not at level one all the way off and you're not no, in no, the no, middle, no. halfway off. It's just yeah. beginning to happen. Yeah. You yeah. do it just then that you notice that. Just then, you do it. Wh which level are you in the, re in, in the quiet mind or where are you? I, I, I think I'm, 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 I'm unable to, when I sit in a meditation now, um, it's automatically goes to a very quiet, quiet state. I, I'm not able to generate- so You're up in nothingness area. I'm not able to generate, even if I start with a, um, a loving- I don't kindness. want you to start. I want you to just tell me where it's happening. The moment I sit, close my eyes, it's immediately goes, everything goes quiet. Okay. Like good. off. Okay, fine. Then you keep going and you just sit and just to see what happens next. That's the only reason you're there is just to see what happens next. No opinions. Yeah. Okay. Any, any feeling, any aware, awareness is equivalent to tension. Yeah. See, it's like this. There's a sensory trigger and then this is starts and then there's awareness. You see that awareness is out here, but the sensory trigger was in here. The tension, the sensory, sensory trigger, the attention, the awareness. See, so the moment you feel it, you keep telling the brain, Zaudia. <laughs> Zaudia, just let it go. Never mind it. And stay with just your observation clearly in front of you. Okay. So the mind automatically goes to its its state that time, even if I start with a loving kindness, but within a minute, it just, everything stops. Why are you starting with loving kindness when you sit? Um, I just started it like that. Um, it, it's not, no, no, no specific reason. But immediately- What I'm such saying a, is, you don't- It's such a- Yeah, but just, you, when you're saying I'm- I'm to the level of like nothingness. When you sit, you should start with the directions. Always okay. start with the directions yeah, yeah, yeah. and let yourself fall in, just fall in to where your level is that you're working. Okay? okay. So you just do, and you did, if you went through one time, if you went through one time, you can do it at three minutes each direction instead of five minutes. Okay? I don't know where you are, but you don't need to discuss that with yeah. me here. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, okay, good. Anybody else? Oh, come on, you got to challenge me here. <laughs> <laughs>
What's going on? Hello. <laughs> you Sister, is there. How, how is your, how is your health? Uh, my health, I'm feeling a lot better from this cold. It's dying out. I, I actually have a voice today. That's a tremendous thing. Um, I did a Corona test that turned out I didn't have to do it yet. That was funny. But I did the Corona test and I'm negative. <laughs> I knew I was negative anyway. Uh, but the, the test came back negative. Um, I have to go to the, uh, um, I think tomorrow morning I have to get in touch with the, um, the dentist that's at JJ Hospital. She, she has a good idea and she saw the x-ray. She has a good idea. And I know somebody where she fixed some damaged teeth. And okay. so, so she has an idea that because there's one third of this tooth left, that maybe she can put a, ca a crown on it and then use it for uh, a, a uh, post for another bridge. This is quite a nice idea if it can happen. So I, wanna, I want to go over there to, to that, make the journey over there to um, find out if, that, if that's really uh, what can happen after she looks in the mouth, <laughs> okay. you know? Yeah, and as far as the legs are concerned, we're, we're, it's a toss up between JJ Hospital and then uh, I guess um, another hospital was uh, Barat, Dr. Barat had a different hospital he wanted me to consider, um, but I'll let them both look at the legs. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to have to raise some money from this I, for this, I do have to do that. I've never, never asked for money before I, but I'm gonna have to do that, I think, because the family uh, cannot afford to do the whole thing for me and I'm gonna have to figure out what I have to do. That's all I can tell you right now. Okay. But it's, it looks like the two legs, both, all three hospitals, basically two of the three hospitals have said that the two legs will run six lakhs. That's what they told me. That's all I know. Okay. Yeah. And the other hospital, I haven't, I didn't talk to them yet. So if I go over there to see the dentist, she said she would take me to see the orthopedic doctor there, but they're starting to hurt the legs more than they were. So, but it's okay. I mean, it's life. <laughs> What are you going to do with it? <laughs> you know, there's no way to fix what's happened here. I'm just, you know, that remember you guys have heard the story of what happened in Goa, you know, when I arrived on the plane with, with Monty and they wouldn't let us in. It's essentially if they wouldn't let us in because we had a condition. And you have to understand, <laughs> I think it's pretty remarkable uh, when you look at this story that we got as far as we did before somebody said this to us. <laughs> I think that's the funniest part of the story. But as we're coming off the plane, uh, the doctors and nurses are checking people and we didn't have temperature, but they put us aside because he was in the, in the wheelchair. And then they came over to us after everybody else had been processed through. Uh, and they said, no, you two are going to have to go to the hospital. And we, I just looked at them and I said, why? And she looked at me like, you know, she kind of looked at me like this, you know, the doctor's beside her and she has this, this uh, thing. She goes, looking like this at him, like, what is wrong with her? Doesn't she understand why she has to go to the hospital? And, <laughs> you know, and, and um, Bonji's just sitting there quiet. He's, I don't know, he probably picked up on what it was, but he didn't say anything. And then I said, seriously, why do we have to go to the hospital? Neither one of us are sick. We've just done six retreats and a pilgrimage and we're perfectly healthy. And we've been isolated for months. Why do you want us to send us in a place to a place where everybody's sick? And, <laughs> and she looked at me and he said, well, it's because of your condition. And I said, what condition? And then she said it. <laughs> well, you're old. <laughs> it was like I just cracked up laughing. I said, you know, I'm really only eight years old. I'm 71 is seven plus one, that's eight. I mean, what's the problem here? <laughs> and she looked at the man, the man beside her and looked at me and just started thinking, what's wrong with this person? And Bonte, when the moment the lady said that, that um, this is what cracked me up, you know, the moment that <laughs> He was sitting in the chair and the woman said, uh, you're, you're old. He actually 
performed the exact thing that happened to Sati, son of the fisherman. And I marked it in here so I could find it. Um, he said, um, <laughs> yeah, here we go. He sat in his wheelchair, silent and dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum, without any response. <laughs> And I thought, geez, that's amazing. He just did that right in front of me. And I'm there like, neither one of us had had anybody, honestly, to that point in Goa, actually look us in the face and said, you know something? You're old. <laughs> so I think it's a, a largely a mental thing uh, when you look at this whole thing, nature. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so I, I'm always teaching people how to do that. Whenever your age is, just add it up and leave it alone. I'm sorry when you get to where it's 11, 12, and 13. It's not cool. <laughs> but, but actually, if it's 11, 12, or 13, you can take those two numbers and you can do it again. <laughs> so, you know, you just figure it out. And it's usually pretty fun between 10 and one years old anyway. So this is it. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, Sister Kina. Uh, Hello always, uh, there. Good, How are you good. doing? I, I'm good, yes. Um, uh, we don't have a video today. Um, uh, you mentioned just something in uh, an earlier part of the talk. You were giving uh, examples of different presentations in nothingness when uh, uh, you were talking about a high-pitched tone and a, a tapping on the cheek and that sort of thing. Can you just just quickly go through different presentations of that same experience? Okay, that's actually infinite consciousness, not nothingness. And I probably confused you because I read as far as nothingness and I backtracked and explained infinite consciousness before I explained nothingness. I'm sorry, I, I misguided you. But um, those three examples are basically the kind of thing that can happen for the student in infinite uh, consciousness um, is that you have what you're actually getting still enough is that you can experience consciousness is happening, but they're happening very fast at first, you see. And so th this can happen in the same way that I was describing how the lights are popping up fast like this, you know, and they're going like this across the, across the screen really, really fast. And then they slow down. And it's interesting because if you're paying attention and just observing, you're not a hard attention, just an interested observation attention, okay? You are just watching these lights. And if you're very calm, the calmer you are, the faster they're gonna slow down. And then if they slow down, it'll be like a bloop. And as it comes up and then it fades away and a bloop, and then it fades away. And our favorite question is to ask you what happened before it popped up? And you have to tell us. <laughs> okay. And then the same thing applies if it's a tap on the cheek, or if it's a if it's a sound that's occurring repetitively in the ear, those are the three things we've experienced with students. Okay, the the um, the the lights when your eyes are closed, or your eyes are closed and you start feeling a kind of tapping that's repeating here. It's consciousnesses. Consciousnesses are happening. Okay. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. You have anything else? Um, no, um, uh, but uh, the the comments on the hindrances there uh, that you were reading and uh, discussing, they're very helpful. So uh, if you're planning to do to, uh, do that or extend that or continue with that next time, that'll be very uh, helpful. There are more, and I would like to keep going from page 126 to, um, I think it's 131, get through where I had underlined everything in that um takes you through the um through what's happening in compassion empathetic joy and equanimity and then it goes and talks a little bit about quiet mind and um seven enlightenment factors and um 
a couple other topics in review. And I think it would be really fun to work with his book and it would help me. I was gonna ask you all need to tell me if you want to do this, but the book is written very well. And uh, it's interesting to hear some of the comments people were writing um, that happened in woven into the um, book, the way he wrote it, he put some comments from students, but um, it would help me because I have to co-teach with him in September, October and November. So I'm, I'm wanting to, you know, get as close as I can into where his terminology is. So we don't uh, deflect from each other, you know, and um, I think we're right. We're pretty much pretty well lined up. I've talked to them a no number of times on the phone about this and we're, we're conniving. We're, we're, we're working on formulating a program <laughs> for this tour. And um, I think it's going to work really well. I do. Yeah. What, where's the, where's the tour taking place? It'll be in India, and it, if everything goes all right, the first one will happen in September, and that one will be in Himachal, in Beer, at the um, Deer Park Institute. And then the second one will happen at Bodh Gaya, and uh, that one will happen uh, something like 12 days after the other one finishes and they'll be staying, we'll be staying up there for about six days just to see some things, you know, and then um, go down to Bodh Gaya and see some things and do a retreat in Bodh Gaya area. And then from Bodh Gaya, we will go over to Nagpur, fly to Nagpur, and we will do um, two retreats at the new center that is uh, going to be dedicated in March, this March. Um, and it really is going to happen. It's it's going fast now because they're only working on the inside and and the grading and everything and uh, landscaping on the outside. So that will be at Jetvan Monastery. And one of the there's probably going to be two retreats that take take place there because we got um, well we had something interesting happen. We thought we were going to go to um, southern India, but the place that we were going to had only only monastics can teach. And so they asked me to come back next year, you know, and I said, OK, I'll be back. <laughs> but um, we can't go together because he's not in robes. And so we were held back from co-teaching there. Yeah, he's not, okay. not ready to put robes on. <laughs> but he probably will. I'm just going to say that. He can laugh at me if he hears this, but you know, maybe he will, maybe, but he's in robes now, and their rule was very strict. So we couldn't do that. So we'll do two retreats at um, Jetvan in the new facility. Yeah. Now, the new facility will hold up to a, probably 125 students eventually. Uh, when they finish all the rooms on the upper upper part, but the lower part is completely done inside and the huge Dhamma Hall. And this is a very exciting thing because the Dhamma Hall for Jetvan Monastery is going to be dedicated in the name of Dhamma Sukha Meditation Hall. Wow. That's really, yeah, we're really happy about that. And the uh, highest um, political representative from Maharashtra is coming and he's doing the... Um, the dedication ceremony and everything. And after that special time, I'm supposed to be able to attend to teaching 100 monks. And that's going to be my next challenge. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'm hoping this, this goes well. Uh, we all, we already designing a way where they don't even have to see me. <laughs> yeah, this is very funny. Um, but it's, it's actually a tradition. You, you don't, I think part of this is Bakunis don't normally teach monks, but I've been asked to do this and I, you know, I'm in a different status anyway. And, and so by going over and setting it up the right way, we, we intend to do it in a very traditional fashion. So you're not going to be seeing me, except you might see what I draw on a board on a screen. That'll be new. <laughs> May's been to a couple of my whiteboard sessions, 
that'll be an, a new experience <laughs> to draw on the board and have you see it above. <laughs> mainly because I have so much fun on my whiteboards, <laughs> but that's okay. I mean, I can figure out ways for you still to smile. Okay, and so that will be very interesting because we're teaching them baseline, baseline twin practice will be taught to them. And the idea is that they will be able to, to learn to teach uh, the villagers and things like that in a very simple way, how to do twin. So we're, we're I'm, I've been spending time working on designing that program also in the when simplest. It will be? Hmm? When, when? It will be? when when is going to conduct that's program? a good question i can't tell you the dates on that because i don't have the dates for the dedication for jetron and that has to happen first and then i guess this follows that program so i i have a feeling well let's put it this way sarma i'm hoping <laughs> You know, because my this hospital thing is going slowly coming into being, and I need about five or six days in the hospital, and then I need about two or three weeks to get really strong, my legs to get really strong, and then I I'm ready to move over there and start doing stuff there. One month minimum. Mm, yeah, about that. So that's, it just didn't fall into place as fast as I thought it would, but it, it will, it will. Everything will just flow like a river. <laughs> it's a good thing I did a lot of canoeing in my earlier years. <laughs> we just let the, the river carry us downstream and hope that we reach the ocean. That's the best thing to do. Okay. Yeah. So everybody done? Yeah. And my bell is really happy. My bell came back to me in the, in the packing. <laughs> so tonight you get to hear the bell after we're finished. Anybody else have any questions last call? Okay. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, sir.